Hello again, Cheeky Monkeys, and welcome to another episode of Nerd of the Third Power, your one-stop shop for all things nerdy and awesome. I'm your host, Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Gonzo. With me, as always, in this epic quest of awesomeness is our, re is our resident anime goddess, the one, the only, the beautiful, the cat. Cat, how you doing? Hello, everybody. I'm doing... Yeah. Okay, I guess. Oh, I'm right there. All right. And uh, also joining us in the other co-pilot's chair is Skyblaze. Skyblaze, how you doing? I'm not bad. Mm -hmm. I have my alcohol. All is well with the world. Uh, uh, one day I'm going to have to go in and re-examine dr our, our company drinking policy. Alright, and... Well, <laughs> it's not like you have any of it, so I have your share. It's not as long like as it's fair. It's not like rations of grog on a pirate ship. <laughs> Why not? Just because I don't drink doesn't give you an excuse to drink more. Why? <laughs> well, I mean, being around you when you're not drunk sure is a uh, reason to drink. But I'm never drunk. Exactly. <laughs> I rest my case, Your Honor. Back to the rum. Fire you all! I swear to God, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Out of a can. Mm. All right, and uh, Brian and John, how are you two doing over there at the kids? I mean, correspondence table. I was my doing knees, all right. <laughs> my my knees are are like up to my chin. Can I get a taller chair? No, you don't get a taller chair until you pay for the table you burn down. Buying flammable tables. What am I supposed to do when I get bored? They're made of wood. <laughs> and I don't expect you to keep. And I don't expect you to keep coming in here trying to pull a Jimi Hendrix and burning shit. Well, you, you hired the wrong some people. Really good psychedelic music. <laughs> some correspondents just want to watch the world burn. <laughs> and you wonder why I and never have money to pay you. Who and then there's some of us who have Blaze in our name and don't feel the need to stop him. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back and watch some wrestling. That's this is crazy. <laughs> Later, guys. And wrestling is more sane <laughs> compared to this show. Compared to this show, hey, no, a little, never. Hey, at least we're <laughs> not, at least we're not physically beating the tar out of each other anymore. I don't know. Seasons one and two were kind of rocky, but you know, hey, we've 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 you know, cats on her meds, and I've I'm seeing therapy, so you know, we've settled down a bit. But anyway, we got a fun show tonight. Uh, tonight we are going to be discussing the 30th anniversary of Ghostbusters and uh, all the permutations of the, of the franchise over the years. And uh, Brian is taking odds as to when Ghostbusters 3 is going to be released. Uh, because he apparently, has, he apparently has not learned that uh, in order to gamble, you cannot fix the bets. Oh, is that? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. You have to be betting on something that could actually happen. <laughs> is that is that the rule? Because I thought this was just free money for me. That's how Vegas works. <sighs> you get shot in Vegas. <laughs> Aha! I've been there and I wasn't. <laughs> okay. All right. But anyway, but we got a lot of show ahead, so we're gonna jump into we're gonna jump as always into Ask a Geek. First question here uh, comes from the Facebook. It comes from Tim Murphy. Again, no relation to the Jurassic Park character, and he asked everyone. What has been your favorite of the Rainbow Rocks shorts? Uh, for those who don't know what he's talking about, uh, in anticipation of the second Equestria Girls movie, Hasbro has been releasing these short little vignettes uh, about the characters. And, um, you know, I, I mean, you know, I've liked a few of them. But uh, what about you guys? What, what, are your, what, are some, what are your favorites, if you've seen them? I've only seen the, the DJ Pony one. I didn't Which... know there were more. I feel like a bad fan now. Yeah, I there's like any of them. There's there's two I didn't of them. They ex I didn't even know they existed. They're they're on the Hub's official YouTube channel. Um, you can you can check them out. There's one where uh, wait wait no I bloody well can't because they're region locked. Oh fuckers. Um <laughs> fuck. Well um don't know what to tell you. Um <laughs> blow Sasha no, blow. Why are you so <laughs> sound like, just sound happened? Like Vector the crocodile? Stop. <laughs> oh, I don't that's know right. That is what anymore. Vector sounds like now, isn't it? Yeah. Anyways, I don't know. I just slip into that voice sometimes. It happens. Oh. But uh, 
I know who I, I'm gonna I've... call if I ever need um, somebody to voice Vector in a project I'm doing. I will definitely be there. Oh yeah, there was a yeah. question. But anyway, um, <laughs> the the DJ Pwn three one is actually the best of them, in my opinion. Um, I've I've seen I think there are two or three of them I can't remember for sure I've seen all of them I believe don't quote me on that I may have missed one or two but of the ones I have seen definitely the DJ Poem three is the most entertaining in my opinion. Yeah, uh, the the vinyl scratch one is uh, is is my favorite out of the out of the set as well, and uh, I, I'm not gonna lie the human uh, the, the the human design for for vinyl is uh, cute as hell I think. And now we're just going to judge you silently. Which is like any other day, so go ahead, judge away. <laughs> I, no, I am nothing if not completely self-aware. No, Gonzo. It's not like any other day. We're usually not silent. <laughs> we're usually pretty judging you about as hard as I can right now. Can you see it? Can you feel it? Okay, I would just like to point out, Brian, John, you guys are the ones who got me into this fa- into this fandom in the first place. So if I do, <laughs> this is true. If something, if if I say or do something that you don't like about uh, in, in, within the Brony fandom, you only have yourselves to blame. Also, I'll take the bullet. I think she's cute too. I can say she's cute. Do you as hard as I can. Sounding. Have you seen any of the shorts other than that one, Gonzo? Uh, I've seen I, I, I've seen them all, though I hesitate to call the, the ones besides the, the the vinyl scratch one shorts because they feel to me like just scenes that have been clipped from the actual movie. Yeah, that was kind of my issue with the one where um, Rainbow Dash and Trixie were having like the the, the duel over the guitar in the store. That yeah. just looked like a clip. Yeah, they, they, they all sort of, with the exception of the Vinyl Scratch one, they all feel like just clips from the show, and I'm just like, I'm going to be pissed if I buy the movie and find out that I've already seen it all in bits and pieces on YouTube. So, Brian, what about you? Have you seen any of them? No, I haven't seen any of them. I didn't, I didn't know this was a thing. I, I said that earlier. Oh, well then. Okay, Maybe well, you I... pay attention. I won't be judging you so hard. <laughs> I will, though. Well- that was a quick ask a geek question. <laughs> what do you think of this thing? What do you think of this thing? It's a thing. Okay, all right, and then uh, we have another one here. This one is in. This one also came from the Facebook. Uh, okay, here we go. And it is from Tiffany. And she asks, inspired by last week's X-Men themed episode, uh, for everyone, what is one superpower you would like to have? And uh, the superpower to have all superpowers doesn't count. So she's she's headed you off at the pass, John. Damn it, they're going <coughs> the Infinity Gauntlet. Nice try, dude. The, the, the Infinity Gauntlet's not really a power, it's a thing. That it counts. It gives you the power. He, man. <laughs> uh, Brian, why well, don't we start you start with you on this one? Yeah, that was what I was gonna say. Brian should start. Well, there's there's a lot of really good ones, but um, I might just have to go with the simple version of you know flight, flight or teleportation, a traveling power. Because I'm just getting it's mostly because I'm getting sick of driving. I was like, man, I wish I could be this place instantly, or I can fly over other people who are crazy on the roads. Well, that's helps. sort of my reasoning behind this. Well, it helps if you didn't live in Texas, where driving one block t- takes three hours. That's that's actually incorrect. It's driving one block, you almost get killed three times. We have this, terrible drivers down here. This is a fact. I have driven <laughs> through Texas enough to verify this it is, is a known. fact. <laughs> it is known. So Brian takes flight. Uh, Kat, what about you? Okay. I have long asserted that the greatest superpower one could ever have would be the ability to make someone else poop themselves. This is oddly specific, but can you imagine fighting like Magneto or somebody like that? And you just point to them and you go, poop. And then they crap themselves. And then they're like crazy weird spandex outfit is now full of poop like they would not be able to do anything else because they would have to go home and change so basically you want spider jerusalem's bowel disruptor 
That... I don't know what you're talking about, but yes. <laughs> she has never read Transmetropolitan, which is a shame because Transmetropolitan should be read by all peoples everywhere. Yes, it should. And for the record, Cat, he does in fact possess a gun that will do exactly that to anyone he shoots it with. with such... See, I don't want a gun. I just want to be able to point to people and say, poop. I think you just like saying the word poop. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is what this is breaking down to. Well, Cat this has the mind a of a universe. small child. We've established that. <laughs> But but other than that, besides the really weird, gross one, which I think would be super effective, I personally would like um, teleportation, just because I do am sick of driving everywhere, and also I really like to travel, but it's hella expensive. Okay, Skyblaze, what about you? Superpower you'd like to have? Well, Brian's already taken flight because he's get, um, but. I would quite like flight. I'd also quite like um, pyrokinesis. Or even telekinesis. Of course you would. Of course you would. What? <laughs> what what, what do you mean favorite? by that? Please explain. <laughs> no, just... just. <laughs> My lack of surprise is just... What? Uh, what? Pyrokinesis. Yeah. Somebody, somebody with a closet full of weapons wants pyrokinesis. I mean, uh -huh. if this isn't just set up for Skyblaze, the supervillain. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> I'm sure you don't. Form oh, blazing you know. sword. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll form the head. Okay, apparently I'm the only one here who watches Voltron. Well, no, no, no that we're was just not laughing at you. We just, not, I, we, we, I we just completely fun-walled your joke. <laughs> I, I exactly. don't... I don't... Uh, I don't know if we had Voltron over here. Oh, or if, that's a shame. Or if we did, I maybe, never saw it. Maybe you had Go Lion, the real series. Maybe. Not complete the bastardized with, one. Complete with Prince Lotor's bizarre Oedipal complex. Which got okay. cut from the English version. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Uh, John, what's your what's your superpower of choice? You know, I like everyone else. I like traveling, and I think flight and teleportation are cool. That would cool abilities that would help with that. But to be completely honest, the superpower I have most frequently imagined having, aside from the Infinity Gauntlet, is um, shape shifting. I would love to be able to just completely alter anything and everything about my appearance at a whim because not only would it just do not only would it be cool and just inherently and also would allow you to you know kind of tweak your looks as you like because everybody has something about the way they look that they don't like but also my halloween costumes would be amazing yeah that's that's kind of a cosplayer's wet dream basically this yes okay uh, let's see. For me, what would be my uh, superpower of choice? You know what? I think I'm going to take a page from Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. I want the ability to make people's heads explode by thinking hard at them. So you see, want to be a scanner then? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, I the problem is worrying. the problem is I would get I would get caught really fast because I would I, I would be the kind of person if I had that kind of power I would not be able to shut up about it I'd make someone's head explode and go God damn did you see that see how high the, that gray matter flew God the hell that didn't satisfy the splatter pattern is amazing <laughs> like a work of art man <laughs> you, would, Jackson... you would actually become a famous artist I'm the Jackson Pollock of, of the anatomy set <laughs> <laughs> I started wearing the Minute, the minute you said take a page of John and the Homicidal Maniac, I'm like, there is no way this can end well. <laughs> I call this one my fourth grade teacher. <laughs> it's a state it's a statement about our modern education system and how it doesn't endure creativity in its children. And and just so we're all clear, most of us would probably end up as supervillains. Yeah. Because none of us can be trusted with our powers. Yeah, I would get up to shenanigans with mine. I'm not going to deny. I feel like I would be responsible. So, now you see, I'm I'm actually, for all of the joking around, I'm actually a big um, 
fan of Spider-Man and I am a big believer in the idea that if you have power you should use it to help those who don't. So I feel I could probably so at least protect someone somewhere and help someone somewhere. With fire. Yeah. You know, this, Why is useful? This this takes this takes me back to the to uh, I don't know if you guys ever read Eight Bit Theater, uh, which is basically a spoof of a uh, final of the original Final Fantasy. There's a I haven't read it, but I knew of it. There's a strip where where uh, White Mage, who was all about the healing and the peace and you know helping people, and Black Mage, who was all about the destruction, are having a debate over which form of magic is better. And White Mage challenges Black Mage to to give a a, a scenario where black magic could help people and says well suppose an orphanage is is burning down it's like okay well what would you do to help the orphans oh i'd pick them off with bolt three one by one but how's that helping them well there's no more orphans (laughs) black mage solves problems with violence yep a man after my own heart (laughs) okay but anyway all right Oh man, okay. Alright, uh, next question here comes from uh, Phil. The question for all of us. Uh, for the bookworms, what was the first book you remember absolutely loving? And I mean proper, oh my god, this is amazing, totally invested kind of love. And what was the most recent book to have the same effect? Uh, Skyblaze, since you're a literature nerd, why don't we start with you on this one? Um, the first book I can remember reading like that was, uh, strangely enough, The Secret Garden where I just couldn't put it down. It went with me, like, in my when I was in bed, in the car, uh, no matter where we went, you know. I think my we went shopping, and I was, like, had it in one hand while I was walking beside the shopping trolley. Uh, because it was... I just found it really interesting. And it was the first book I'd come across that actually was based in Yorkshire. Um, and actually had people speaking with my dialect. Which I don't use on this show, but I do have one. Um, so it had a great effect on me at the time. I just could not put the damn thing down. Okay. And uh, a recent book that's had the same effect? Um, the... Um, What's it called? The Collegium Chronicles by Mercedes Lackey. Which is about four books, but yeah, I couldn't put those down either. Because I, just, I, found the char- I found the characters really interesting, and the world that was built there was just really fascinating. I found it so interesting that I had to go back and read all of the other books that were set in the same universe. Which cost me a fair amount of money on Amazon. Whoops. <laughs> okay. Uh, Brian, what about you? It might have been... This is going to sound so weird. It might have been actually one of those Goosebumps books. I just don't remember which one it was because my memory sucks. Um, but yeah, I do remember like the first time like picking one of those books up uh, and just reading it cover to cover. I think it was like, the great, one of the best things I've ever read. Um, truth be told, it was a children's book. Um, and I was a child at the time. <laughs> Like you do. I was, I was gonna say this was this was last this was last week. <laughs> <laughs> I've never read one of these before. Gee golly, gosh, this is great. They were really wow, all aliens. Sounds just like me. That sounds just like me as a child. Cat, <laughs> how did you know? So you were so you were a child in an Archie comic book. <laughs> yes. Either Brian that or was... like a weirdly upbeat peanut strip. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Did the you, one not. Did you go to the? Really did brown. you go to the malt <laughs> shop with your best girl and dance to the jukebox? It was the bee's knees. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys I, even I speaking a... English now? <laughs> I need. I need Brian saying it was the bee's knees as my ringtone. <laughs> Skyblaze, we're Skyblaze. We're American. We don't speak English. Not the king. That's kings, a very at good least. point. <laughs> we speak American. Queens. Queen's to, English. To, yeah, to bring up the uh, the most recent one, the most recent book I'm actually really enjoying is actually not like a fictional book, but it's um uh, it's called Monty Python and Philosophy, where it's a bunch of different sort of uh, philosophers and guys and who's sort of studied it, writing different long essays about different Monty Python's themes in their movies and their TV show, sort of bringing it back to philosophy, and it's actually a fantastic read. Most of it is about life of Brian. 
but still that's it's just a one it's a, it's something that actually kind of caught my attention my dad gave it to me for christmas I went ooh, what is this and i've just been reading it back and forth you know that 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 uh, reminds me of a, a friend of my mother's who teaches european history in high school and when she gets to the medieval ages she uses Mon- monty python and the holy grail as a teaching aid because okay, jokes I- I have a, f- um, a friend of my mother's who is a, uh, a teacher of modern history at a sixth form college in Manchester who uses Blackadder Goes Forth for the First World War. <laughs> no joke! <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I've, I, th- th- this, is, this is probably going to get me stoned in the streets, but I have actually never watched Blackadder. What? It's on, it's on Netflix, you Burn heathen. the heretic! I'm judging you really hard now. <laughs> You're getting judged so much this episode. <laughs> We're so fired by the end of this episode, too, I think. Oh yeah. You may not even last that long. <laughs> I may just drop At you ben. off from the I may just drop you off from the call and just do the rest of the episode <laughs> myself. And I'll tell At you ben. what, I saw I saw the new Transformers movie last night. Oh, believe me, I've got things to say. <laughs> but that's oh, our discussion topic. <laughs> Suddenly, I will not epic. go anywhere near that pile of shite. <laughs> Word. I'm fine. That's actually. That's actually. That's actually our. Breathe, that, honey. Breathe. That's actually our next question, but we'll finish this one up first. <laughs> okay, Cat. What about you? Uh, first book that you absolutely really loved, and a recent one that had that same effect. God. Um. Oh, just about everything I read as a kid uh, was terribly, terribly engrossing, and I could not stop. Um, cause that's all I did when I was a kid. I would spend like my entire summers just going to the library and getting a stack of like 12 books. Um, but probably, uh, I almost want to say Animorphs was probably one of my like ultimate, like have to read every single one of them. It's just like soul consuming kind of books. I was, in, I was books. in six, I was in six form when they came out. What does that mean I for us, uh, Yanks? Um, between 16 to 18. Oh, I was oh, okay. a little younger than that. I was probably like maybe maybe 12 or something. Ah. I, I don't know. I don't know when I started reading that. <laughs> You're so old. You're really not though. <laughs> anyway. Cat, quit being nice. mean. Nice save there at the end, cat. <laughs> I I, I, like I work every day. Cry now. I work every day with people who are like eight to ten years younger than me, so you're not allowed to feel old because then I feel old too. But anyway, anyway, um, so probably Animorphs or maybe some of the Fear Street because I would say Goosebumps, but I skipped over Goosebumps and went immediately to Fear Street, uh, which is probably a lot of the problems with me stem from that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but a recent book I really haven't been reading very much lately which is terrible to say Um, that's that's awful I I haven't read anything recently so much as reread like Lord of the Rings and stuff and those are pretty fucking engrossing but then I try and read the other Tolkien stuff and then I go I can't read the Silmarillion it's a brain explode I can say I say as I can say as a point of pride that I have actually read the Silmarillion all the way through. I I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to do it, but it's just so hard. <laughs> it's, it's it's not an easy book, and I wish you the best of luck. It's it's not an easy book at all. You know you know you know what it, it you know what it's like. It's like tr- it's like reading the Bible cover cover to cover. Because so it basically except, is an academic mm, text. Yeah. Yes. Pretty much. Okay, uh, so John, what about you? Well, uh, much like Cat, I haven't been reading as much uh, lately. Oh, wait, wait, first we've got to say the older one, that's right. I can't remember for 100% certain what the first book that just really sucked me in was, but I can think of one or two of them from my childhood that really, really engrossed me. Um, I really seriously got into uh, Banicula, Anikula by James Howe. Oh my god, I thought uh, I was the only person who ever read those. Oh man, I read like, I had read the entire series at one point when I was a kid, including my personal favorite, Howliday Inn. And, uh, <laughs> I loved those books. Absolutely loved them. Um, I also got really, really, 
really engrossed in this Bruce Cavill book called uh, Jeremy Thatcher, Dragon Hatcher. Um, I used to reread. I've heard of that one. I've heard of that one. I might have actually read that. It is so good. I have no idea why it has not been made into a movie yet. It so deserves it. Because because we uh, have to take shitty things like Aragon and make them into movies instead. Oh, you sorry, mean, I you said mean, that out loud. You mean Eragon, your one-stop online shop for all your ragon needs? <laughs> that was awful, I stole that. And you should feel I bad. S- I stole that from Rift Tracks, and I am unashamed of that fact. Um, <laughs> you couldn't have stolen a good joke. Well, you know, I I don't want to break my pattern. He, he has a reputation <laughs> to uphold. Damn it. <laughs> As for recent, um, much like much like Cat, the the most recent thing I read was actually something that I reread, but have found it engrossing uh, both times that I've read it, and that's American Gods by Neil Gaiman. Um, I actually yes. just finished that a couple of days ago. And it had been a few years since I had read it, so there was a lot that I had forgotten and a lot of wonderful little details that I had forgotten. And it just made me want to get in the car and go on a road trip all over the U.S. again because I love road trips. I want to go see the house on the rock. Um, As far as nonfiction, though, another really engrossing read not long before that. And yes, this is also technically a reread, and this is more in keeping with my character and obsessions. Um, there's this book by a man named David J. Skull, who might actually be one of a tiny handful of bigger vampire and Dracula nerds than I am. And the book is called Hollywood Gothic, the tangled tale, I think, or story of Dracula from novel to stage to screen. And all it is is an account of how Dracula went from being a Victorian, a late 19th century novel, to a stage play, to a movie, and how bizarrely complicated and convoluted that journey was, and how many people were involved in it at various points, and it is way, way more engrossing than you would ever expect it to be. Okay. Uh, well, for me, uh, I've always read at a higher level than most of my peers. My mom likes to brag that I taught myself how to read. Uh, not sure if that's true or not, but take, make of that what you will. Um, but, like, I, I can say that I was, I was reading, like, at college level when I was, like, 12. Um, the, so the first book that really I got really invested in was uh, actually The Hobbit. That was, that was <coughs> the first book that I that I loved to death. And I to this day, I still reread it, reread it every year, like, religiously. Um, lately, uh, the book series that's got me, uh, really enthralled is the Horus Heresy series, which I've mentioned before. Uh, it's sort of the, the origin story of the Warhammer 40k universe, but if you read it the right way, it plays out almost like a sci-fi retelling of the, uh, the Judeo-Christian war in heaven when Lucifer rebelled against God and was cast out. And that, that kind of, that kind of imagery is just like, you know, it, I'm, I'm nuts about that. And I love that, that, those kind of stories. So uh, the Horus Heresy series is what I'm following really closely right now. Um, I also really like the Hunger, Ga- really like the Hunger Games trilogy. I've I had to, I've finally gone back and finished that, and uh, I can't wait to see what they do with uh, the Catching Fire movies. Although I wish they hadn't split them. I'll say it before and I'll say it again. Uh, Harry Potter set a bad precedent. So um, yeah, that's that. And our last question here, because we've tallied on this long enough, uh, is one for the the trans fans in the audience. Uh, have you guys seen Transformers 4, and what do you think of it? And I haven't seen it. Alright, I'm going into the bunker. You guys have fun. (laughs) Gonzo, go nuts. Haven't seen it. Don't plan to see it. Had my, had my fill of Bayformers. I didn't even see the third one, so, and also, uh, from what I've heard, it has hardly any of Grimlock in it, which, considering all the publicity around that, means fuck you. Second of all, it doesn't have the proper voice of Grimlock. Which is weird, because they got Frank Welker this time around. I know! But anyway, I have... Uh, I, the thing about this movie is, like, it wasn't even... Like, it was... I just liked it so much, I can't even get worked up about it. So here's just a, a quick bullet point list uh, that I posted on my Facebook, uh, my thoughts on the film. Uh, okay, uh, first point. This movie is about two and three quarters of an hour long. It feels a hell of a lot longer, and not in a good way. It starts to overstay its welcome at about an hour and 45 minutes. 
Except for the bumbling rich guy, all the characters are complete non-entities with no real visible personality beyond a few token character types that were worn out in the 80s, like the overprotective dad, the rebellious teenage daughter, etc. Uh, the plot is a convoluted mess. We jump back and forth between the government guy, played by Kelsey Grammer, who I am convinced took this role to pay dues for the Fraser spinoff he's been wanting for years, hunting down Autobots, to another Transformer hunting Autobots for their quote-unquote creators, to rich guy bringing Megatron back to life as Gal Galvatron in a scheme even Dr. Frankenstein would call ill-advised, and half of them don't even get resolved. In fact, most of them are blatant sequel bait. Uh, speaking of Galvatron, you could have cut him and his plotline from the whole movie and nothing would have changed. Literally nothing. Uh, the robot designs of this movie are just dumb. One Autobot has a metal trench coat. A metal fucking trench coat. Oh dear God. A uh, personal gripe, Optimus Prime declares I'll kill you several times throughout and then just straight up kills a human being near the end of the film. Not even by accident, what? he just full on shoots him. Uh, that's not the Optimus Prime I know and love. Uh, in fact, it seems like nobody is giving any thought to the collateral damage this time around. In the first film, at least some effort was made to keep innocent people out of harm's way as much as possible. But in this film, it's like, yeah, this looks like a good place to throw down, middle of a Chinese apartment complex. Yeah, don't worry about squishing anybody. Uh, still related note, the Autobots in general just have a shitty attitude. They pretty much say, fuck these humans, ad nauseum. And finally, the film is just boring. There's literally nothing in this movie the series hasn't done before and done, God help me, better already. The film is just going through the motions to the degree that it feels like they didn't know how to stop giving us a near three-hour snore fest. But Gonzo, you virile stallion of a man, I hear you say. Surely as big a trans fan as you are, you must have something good to say about the film. And there is. I can honestly say that I did not, that I did not miss Shia LaDoof shouting, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, a thousand times over. So, final thoughts. Basically, watch it on cable. If you come across it while channel surfing, but otherwise, don't give your money away. Well, that was can I, erudite. Can I come out now? Is it safe? Is it safe? It's been safe. Done? I didn't. I was. I didn't go on a uh, on a rant. I uh, always have to take did. precautions. So, but no, it's like it was just. It was just overall just a boring film. Like it. It really was. And. Yeah, like I said, just don't even bother. Like, I, 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 the long time listeners know, I have been a staunch defender of the first and third Transformers movies. Uh, Revenge of the Fallen can go hang. But, I mean, even I thought enough was enough after the third one. I was like, okay, that's it. Franchise is over. Move on. So, yeah. Transformers 4, not really worth it. So, that's all the Ask Geek questions that we have for this week. As always, you can send them to us through the email at billysmith at channelawesome.com. Or uh, drop them in the That Guy with Glasses forum thread of the same name. Or if you follow us on Facebook, uh, which if you're watching this on YouTube, the link to our Facebook is below the feed. Uh, Tom, the producer, actually posts a thread every week uh, ask, looking for Ask a Geek questions for the next episode. So, uh, yeah, if you're following us on Facebook, you can drop us Ask Geek questions that way. And with that, we're going to jump right into our new segment starting this week with Brian. Brian, take it away. Thank you. Well, here at the Multiverse Headlines, it's officially countdown to San Diego Comic-Con. The weeks leading up to the event will hopefully be full of news, new titles, changes in teams, and all that, and a bag of chips. Boom Studios is the first company to get started, and they're going to be releasing something new throughout the month of July, leading up to San Diego Comic-Con. First, it's Mark Wade, who actually left the company in 2010 after a brief time as their editor-in-chief, as well as his irredeemable story that was going on. He will be returning to the publisher with a new book. Not yet is known about the book or who else will be working on it with Wade. That looks like to be one of the other announcements coming down the line. Jeff Parker and Sandy Jarrell are the team behind Batman 66, the digital first title for DC. But they are also working on a new original graphic novel for Omni Press titled Meteor Men. It's called a suspenseful tale of an alien invasion, but from a perspective of a small town teenager. The events fold out into larger ones, and the book promises that you can't guess where the story is going. The book is currently available for pre orders with your local comic book shop as well as Amazon.com. DC has finally stopped being quiet these last few weeks and dropped a couple of stories. Up first is the expansion of the Batman line of books with two new titles, but they are a little bit different. 
The first title is Arkham Manor by Gary Duggan and Sean Crystal that goes to tell the story of stately Wayne Matter getting made into a new Arkham Asylum basically. There seems to be that something's gonna bad happen to the current Arkham Asylum and you need to put those prisoners somewhere. Somehow it becomes Wayne Manor. Not really sure but I'm sort of interested to see where it goes. The second title is the bit different one. It's called Gotham Academy. This title is written by Becky Kulayan and Brendan Fletcher and with the art by Carl Kershick. It's a monthly teen drama set in Gotham City's most prestigious prep school. You may be asking how does this connect to Batman besides being in Gotham? Well he's actually one of the school's benefactors. This is sort of interesting because it actually hosts a brand new set of characters with the possibility of old ones popping up from time to time. Though it's odd because Batman's actually not going to be in this book but still technically a Batman book because it takes place in Gotham. Comics everybody. Both books will be hitting the shelves at different times in October. The second big news is that Wonder Woman will be getting a new creative team come November when the current team of Brian Azzarello and Cliff Chang will be ending their run which started in September 2011. The new team will be husband and wife creator duo Meredith and David Finch. David is fresh off Forever Evil and has worked on other titles of the big DC heroes but only rarely has he worked with Wonder Woman. Meredith, I am unfamiliar with her work as a writer, so I'll actually have to wait and see how she does with the book. As for David, I do hope he can make the deadline with the art. No offense David, I love your art, but there are times where you do hold books back as the delays, Forever Evil being one of them. The duo, like I said, will take this book over in November. In my last story of the day, DC Comics is now going to be offering a rare Judo Kuwata Batman manga, mostly known as the Bat Manga. First seen in 1966, the manga is based off the Adam West TV show version of the character. They will be releasing chapters weekly for 99 cents and then will collect them out in print later on for three trade paperbacks. Also interesting, that is also going to retain the right to left reading of the original manga. This is a manga I actually already own in the giant 1000 some odd page collecting all of the different chapters and mangas into a big set. Now they're sort of doing it fully translated on the internet first and collecting them up in trades later. Well, that's all the news I have around this tour of the multiverse, so I'm going to hand the baton off to my film collecting correspondent, Projections John. John, take Thanks, away. Brian. Well, without further ado, let's dive into the movie bin and see what we've got this week. We begin today on a downer note, as I unfortunately so often have lately. A lot of you may remember DreamWorks' fantastic feature, How to Train Your Dragon. A few of you may also be aware that there is a sequel currently in theaters, How to Train Your Dragon 2. A few of you may even have gone to see it, but apparently not enough. Despite the fact that Dragon 2's domestic opening weekend was about 14% larger than the original, it still fell far short of its predicted gross. So far, in fact, that it actually caused a dip in the value of DreamWorks stock. Unfortunately, though, that's not the worst of it, as its second weekend showed a much, much sharper drop than anticipated, and that's apparently led DreamWorks to lay off around 40 to 50 employees, and apparently with very little warning. According to the Animation Guild's blog, all employees in departments which were overstaffed, who did not have long-term contracts or were currently assigned, were told to clear out their desks, although according to the union blog, at least one employee claimed she wasn't even allowed to go back to her desk when the announcement came down. This is just true hard break for animators, some of the most unappreciated and underpaid artists in the film industry, and I can only hope that their fortunes improve soon. Moving on to better news, it appears that there's one rather admired nerdy movie that might be setting itself up for a successful franchise. Pacific Rim. Guillermo del Toro, my fanboy creative crush whom I am totally not recreating in effigy lacking only clippings from his beard, has announced that he is going ahead with a sequel for his, quote, giant fucking robots fighting giant fucking monsters flick. 
But the good news for Pacific Rim fans doesn't stop there. In addition to continuing the comic, which began with the prequel Year Zero, he is apparently also developing an animated series adaptation of the project. That's definitely welcome news to my ears, as I can think of few modern movie franchises which would translate as well to the small screen and animated form as Pacific Rim. Now, obviously these are early days yet, so there are no official release dates, and these things can sometimes fall through. As always, I'll update you guys as all of these projects chug along. On the subject of animated series, there's an interesting development over at the Emmys. Apparently, the television awards have decided to expand their definition of TV, and have now opened up to accepting internet-only content for nomination. Starting with the two nominations picked up for the Netflix exclusive adventures of the world's fastest snail, Turbo. Now, I haven't seen the Turbo cartoon myself, but speaking as someone who spends a lot of time consuming, and even a little bit of time making, internet-exclusive content, this is kind of a big deal. The Emmy Awards are even starting to include certain forms of interactive media in their nominations, such as the recent viral video-slash-game-ish Scarecrow promotion, created by William Joyce's Moonbot Studios for Chipotle, which garnered a nomination for Outstanding New Approaches, Original Daytime Program, or Series. Now, obviously these are still big names we're talking about here. Turbo comes from DreamWorks, and Chipotle is, well, Chipotle. But if the Emmys are opening up the playing field to all internet content, we could see a truly exciting explosion of new talent being acknowledged in the next few years. Unless the FCC screws us all over by giving Comcast and Verizon what they want, of course, but <laughs> let us not risk invoking the dark gods of telecom by speaking too much about them. Speaking of the gods, Ah yeah, look how smooth that segue was. Some of you might recall me mentioning my love for Neil Gaiman's American Gods just a few minutes ago. And I am definitely not alone in my love of this fantastic novel, as several other aficionados of Gaiman's unique approach to America and mythology have tried to adapt it for the big or small screen multiple times. But much like the oft-attempted Sandman movie, it's never really worked out in the past. Also, however, much like the Sandman movie, it looks like now it might finally be happening. TV's Stars Channel has placed a script-to-series order for the show, and Brian Fuller of Hannibal fame will be handling the script side of this business. Gaiman himself will be executive producer on the pilot. Now, bear in mind, it really is still too early to celebrate. This is not the first time this project has started to gear up, and there is still plenty of time for things to go wrong. But maybe... Just maybe, if we keep our fingers crossed, say our prayers, and make the proper sacrifices to the Allfather, we might just finally see the journeys of Shadow and Mr. Wednesday across the strangest and yet oddly truest version of the United States ever committed to paper. I don't really have a smooth segue for this next story, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. All of you know that J.J. Abrams is currently hard at work on Star Wars Episode Seven. What you might not know are the rumors about some disagreements between Abrams and Disney as to the film's release date. With the house that Walt built allegedly arguing for an earlier release and Abrams purportedly pushing for a later one. Whether there's any truth to the difficulties between the two, I don't know. But what we do know for sure is that while Abrams will be inaugurating the new trilogy, he will not be continuing it. Instead, writer-director Ryan Johnson of Looper fame has been handed the reins to episodes 8 and 9. Well, according to sources at Deadline, at least. The Rap, on the other hand, claims that Johnson has not yet been hired to take charge of Episode 9, but will merely be writing a script treatment for it. Still, either way, I'm happy to see Johnson hop aboard the Star Wars franchise, as he's definitely proven his worth as a creative and skilled director, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he does with his time with the Star Wars mythology. And finally, I'm going to be just a little self-indulgent here for a moment. All of our faithful listeners know that I'm something of a horror movie fan, and if you've been listening to the show for long enough, you'll know that one of my all-time favorite big-screen boogeymen has always been Freddy Krueger. Unfortunately, we haven't seen a whole lot of Freddy since the poorly received and, well, frankly, very misguided reboot starring Jackie Earl Haley in the role that Robert England made famous, and we haven't seen England himself, the only real Freddy in my book, in the iconic makeup since 2003's Freddy vs. Jason. But, 
If you're able to make it out to the Chicago Horror Convention's flashback weekend on Friday, August 8th, then you'll get a chance to see England wearing the makeup that put him on the horror map again for the first time in 11 years. And in person, no less. The tickets aren't cheap at $365, but considering I would actually give up an arm and a leg for this opportunity, well, or at least several of my least favorite toes, I'd say if you're a horror movie fan and you've got the chance, go for it. There's no telling when or if you'll ever get a chance to meet Freddy in person again, and with this being the 30th anniversary of the original Nightmare on Elm Street, there's no better time. Man, 1984 sure was a good year for movies, wasn't it? And that's it for your movie news. Welcome back to Conversations. And since part one of my convention survival guide last week got some decent feedback, I figure I'll carry on with some more tips for the summer con season. So, following on from last week. Check out number seven, check out your food options. Some convention hotels and centres are in the middle of nowhere, which can severely limit your choices for refueling your geek engine. This can be a problem if you're on a budget, since food at convention centres and hotels can sometimes be pretty expensive. If your research suggests that there's a lack of eateries near the venue, be sure to pack plenty of snacks or food that can be easily prepared with nothing more sophisticated than a kettle and a fork. Number 8. Prepare your paperwork. As anyone who has ever worked on a convention registration desk will tell you, having someone who hasn't got their confirmation letter, registration number or ID can make the lives of the conrunners on the desk a hell of a lot harder, especially when there's a long queue for the registration desk, and this goes for the hotel registration desk too. Make sure all of the required paperwork is packed and ready to hand when you get to the registration desk. It'll speed things up for everyone involved, including yourself. Number 9. Charge your electronics. Most nerds love to have their cameras, iPads, mobile phones, Kindles, laptop and portable games consoles with us at all times. Far from being a distraction, these devices can let you record and share the experience, or even participate in the online interactive parts of conventions for those events that have hashtags and similar such things. Or you can grab a couple of hundred street pass hits on your 3DS. With that in mind, little is worse than lining up for that perfect photo when your battery dies. So make sure you pack charges for your devices and keep the power topped up. Number 10. Travel arrangements. If you need to travel to get to your con, and you almost certainly will, make sure you plan your journey well in advance. If you're travelling by car, don't just rely on your GPS or Google Maps, believe me, that can make you come unstuck, but buy yourself a decent atlas. If you are travelling by plane or train, try and book your tickets as early as possible so you can get the best prices, and try and avoid travelling at rush hour, as this will make things cheaper as well. If the event is in a city, a decent A to Z wouldn't go amiss either. Number 11. Keep some money aside. It's really easy to get carried away if there's a really great dealer's hall. Or just spend all night chatting in the bar, buying everyone drinks. And then you wake up in the morning and realise that you spent all of your money for the entire weekend. Best thing to do, before the convention starts, is to set aside an emergency fund and leave it somewhere safe. Most hotels either have a room safe, or will let you hire a safety deposit box for a reasonable amount. Prepaid debit cards are pretty good for keeping your emergency funds on. This is especially important if you're heading abroad for your convention. Most prepaid foreign currency debit cards are insured, just like your regular debit or credit card, so they really are worth looking into. Well, that's it from me for this week. Over to you, Kat. Thanks, Skyblaze. There really isn't a whole lot of news this week, so I'm going to keep it super, super short. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences has issued their yearly invitations to the organization, and once again director Hayao Miyazaki has been invited into the fold. Miyazaki has refused the invitation at least three times in the past. Fellow nominee and Studio Ghibli co-founder Toshio Suzuki has proposed that Miyazaki's past declining of the invitation was because the director felt it brought him too close to retirement. Now that Miyazaki has retired from feature filmmaking at least, is it time for him to finally accept that invitation? I guess we'll find out. If he doesn't, Suzuki certainly should. The Academy is well known for being composed of mostly old white dudes, and it would be nice to add a little diversity if they do accept. Miyazaki will be accepting an invitation to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame. Each year, the Hall of Fame inducts five new members, and this year, Miyazaki will be added to the illustrious list alongside artist Frank Rosetta, author Lee Brackett, author Olaf Stapleton, and director Stanley Kubrick. And 
that's actually all the news I wanted to talk about. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Sailor Moon Crystal, which is starting this weekend. I've been just going on and on about it in my headlines for the past several months, and now it's finally here. The series will stream on Crunchyroll.com every two weeks on Saturdays, starting July 5th, that's this weekend, at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Crunchyroll stream will be available in the U.S., Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Central America, South America, and Mexico. It's important to know, and this is really cool, the stream will be available to free and premium members at the same time, and they never do that, so that means they love you and they want you to watch the show. Hulu will also be streaming the series, but I haven't heard their exact release details, but it's probably going to be just about the same thing. And I guess if Hulu's going to stream it, it's probably also going to be available on Viz's Neon Alley website. Uh, again, I don't know for sure, but given that Viz licensed the show and their stuff gets hosted on Hulu, it makes sense. Nico Nico will, of course, be streaming it in Japan. They were the first website to announce that they would have it. And I think most countries can access that or have their own branch of the website like some Asian countries do. But again, I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, if I didn't list your country or territory or region or whatever, don't worry. There's probably a legitimate release somewhere there, and it probably won't take much to find it. Just whatever you do, make sure that you're watching this show legally. It's the only way to really show your support, and the studios have really gone out of their way with this show in particular to make sure that everybody will have access to it simultaneously worldwide for free. So show your support and hopefully if we get enough people watching it we can actually get more than just one season out of it. Crossing my fingers. And just to satisfy my curiosity, let me know in the comments what you guys are using to watch it. If you're using Crunchyroll, if you're using Hulu, I just want to know what kind of a viewing experience you guys have with those particular websites. And if you can't wait to get your Sailor Moon fix, episodes from the original Sailor Moon series are running on Neon Alley and Hulu, with more episodes appearing every Monday. Anyway, that's all I've got going on in the anime and manga world. Over to you, Dr. Gonzo. All right, thank you, Kat. Our top story in the gaming world tonight. The International Esports Federation has made a change to its male-only policy for its Hearthstone tournament. The self-proclaimed ruling body on esports came under fire for its policy of separating male and female entrants into two separate tournaments. The backlash has led the company to alter its male-only tournament into an open-for-all style event, while still keeping the female-only tournament open as a quote-unquote option. The company made the following statement on its Facebook page, quote, Our reason for maintaining events for women only is that we acknowledge the importance of providing women with ample opportunities to compete in eSports, a currently male-dominated industry. Without efforts to improve female representation in eSports events, we can't achieve true gender equality. However, we realize that hosting a male-only competition is not the right way to go. As we stated, the industry is already male-dominated. The fact that a female-only competition is being held for the reasons stated above doesn't mean that there is need to define the main competition competitions as male only. Well, for my part, this is the age of the internet, where it's very hard for your social or professional gaffes to be for forgotten and forgiven, and if the IESF is serious about legitimizing esports, which, God, that sounds weird to say, they've turned that goal into an even more uphill battle. In other news, Airtight Games, the developer of Murdered Soul Suspect, has closed its doors. The announcement was made over the company's Twitter page, layoffs began earlier this year, and now the company has begun selling off its office equipment. Lindsay Lohan has filed a lawsuit against Rockstar Games over the character of Lacey Jonas from Grand Theft Auto V, claiming the character is based on her likeness and behavior. To quote the complaint, The portraits of Lohan incorporated her image, likeness, clothing, outfits, plaintiff's clothing line products, ensemble in the form of hats, hairstyle, sunglasses, jean shorts worn by the plaintiff that were for sale to the public for at least two years. End quote. And great repeating yourself there about four or five times. While several of the missions surrounding Lacey Jonas are parodies of the Hollywood lifestyle, for example, evading paparazzi, which I should note Lohan has failed to do on many occasions, and while Lohan is certainly one of the biggest train wrecks in recent Hollywood history, it should be noted she's not the only engine in the scrapyard. This action follows swift on the heels of Ellen Page's ire at The Last of Us for the similarities between her and Ellie. And in our final story, wow, most I've had to talk about in a while, Crytek's recent comment about not having... Not, excuse me. In other news, wow, this is the most I've had to talk about in a while, Crytek's recent comments about not being in financial trouble may not be as true as they'd like to believe. A report from Develop Online shows that a number of Crytek employees have not been paid for their full salary since April, while the report shows some employees are still being paid. The average payout was about £700 last month, with a further payment made on June 16th. A payment promised on June 27th has yet to materialize. 
And that's all the headlines we have for this week. We're going to take a quick musical break. When we come back, Ghostbusters. We're going to discuss the 30th anniversary of our favorite Ghostbusting franchise and uh, all the permutations that it has been through thereof. Stay tuned. We've got a lot of fun stuff ahead. Good evening, everybody. This is Tom the Engineer, and I'm here with this week's musical break. This week's submission comes from artist Ellery Bonham, and the song's title is Dreamer. This song is off of her forthcoming EP titled Ellery, releasing this July on the 26th. When asked about the song's conception, she had this to say, I started writing Dreamer about one person in particular, but as most songs and creative projects do, it had a different plan for itself once I got started. Dreamer is about the dangerous similarities in the guys I've been falling for, ones that seem too good to be true and, unfortunately, were. Like any pattern someone may have in the people they choose, Dreamer turned out to be my realization that I need to notice the trend in the choices I'm making instead of spending too much time blaming someone else. For more information on Ellery and her album, you can head over to her Facebook page by entering oglink.com slash 92t into your web browser, and that'll take you straight there. And without further ado, this is Dreamer. <laughs> He's a beggar for a pension A thief between the sheets Swears you look a lot like love And loving's what he needs And if I Just 
All right, and we are back. And this week, uh, we are discussing something that uh, we've really been looking forward to. Uh, the 30th anniversary of the Ghostbusters franchise. I'd say one of the the, the five must-see 80s franchises that, that has endured uh, for so long and is just so in is such a part of our cultural consciousness. Uh, it turns 30 years old this month, and uh, it's actually being celebrated in some theaters by a theatrical re-release of the first film. And uh, we thought it'd be fun to talk about uh, the Ghostbusters over the years and some of the ups, the downs, the creamy middles, and uh, discuss some of our favorite uh, Ghostbusters-related uh, memories. So, uh, John, as our film nut, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit, uh, for the five people who've never seen Ghostbusters, those five sad, poor souls uh, who have never known joy in their lives, uh, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the first Ghostbusters film, how it came to be, and its impact on popular culture? Well, where do I begin? Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I've been told that the beginning is always a good place to start. Yeah. Totally overrated. Uh, yeah, it's too mainstream. Um, don't don't turn hipster on me. I swear to God, I will I will I will fire you in a heartbeat and make make your make a necklace from your teeth. You know, I was actually accused of being a hipster just for wearing glasses once. I told them I had bad eyesight before it was cool. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> The original Ghostbusters um, is about these three scientists who hire a fourth guy um, because they need extra help. Three scientists, parapsychologists, excuse me, who um, they get tossed out of their university because the university believes that parapsychology and their research into it is basically utter crap, and from the university's perspective, I can't blame them. Uh, but they very quickly get vindicated as a whole bunch of supernatural activity starts happening around New York. Uh, they set up a business uh, catching ghosts using experimental, unlicensed nuclear devices on their backs. And uh, as, the, as the movie progresses, you start to they, they start to wonder, and the audience starts to wonder along with them, why are so many ghosts showing up? Um, right now, and the answer turns out to be something rather apocalyptic. Um, as far as its cultural impact, it is basically immeasurable. I have seen references to this thing just about everywhere. The theme music, the costumes, the, the basic concept of, uh, of, of ghost catchers has kind of caught on in popular culture in this, in this series. It spawned cartoons, toys, comic books, video games, um, one sequel, and an eternally in development hell second sequel. And it's, it's, it's one of those movies that nobody really expected to be as huge as it was at the time of its release, but it just kind of took pop culture by storm. And for a lot of people, it's still one of the best, if not the best movies, for, the best movie from the 80s. Some people consider it their favorite 80s movie. I'm one of them. It's just, it's just that good. And it's just had that much of an impact. Like, the films almost seem like it was a lightning in a bottle sort of catch. Like, everything seemed to work for it. Like, uh, the, the actors, the script, everything was just, like, it's almost those rare movie where everything clicked, like, almost perfectly. You know, you're almost shocked by it. And you sort of just enjoy it afterwards. And, like, more times you watch it, the more you seem to enjoy it. Um, I saw it, actually, I saw it um, in theaters once uh, when the Alamo Draft House down here was actually playing it. And we had, uh, we, it's so great, they actually had it, we had interactiveness. It was a quote -a it was a quote along. And the guy said, <sighs> we don't really have any subtitles for a quote along. So you guys just quote what you feel like. So it was basically a theater of people quoting the entire movie from start to finish. And then whenever a proton pack went off, we all shook our glow sticks in the air. And then we had marshmallows. <laughs> I, uh, I had a similar theatrical experience with a, with a little re-release. There was a theater I was living, uh, I was living by in one of the five states I lived in. Uh, that was doing a bunch of retro movies, and they were showing them on actual film, so this was pretty impressive. Um, and they also got actual still-on-film trailers from really obscure 80s movies. The only one I remember 
I don't even remember which movie it was. All I know is that the trailer said Jean Claude Van Damme about thirty times within a minute. Um, <laughs> oh, that only let, that, that could only, be any of his movies. <laughs> I, was about, I was about to say in eighties. Geez, that narrows it down to about only a thousand films that came out in the eighties. <laughs> I know. It just cracked me up more and more each time. I don't remember anything except Jean-Claude Van Damme was in it, probably doing split kicks. But, um, there there was a guy who came in, like, the full costume with, like, a really authentic-looking uh, proton pack and, and everything. He was the only one in the theater who was wearing full costume, but, you know. It's, it's funny for me, because I actually didn't grow up with the Ghostbusters movies first. The first exposure I had to them was the cartoon. Well, that's 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 a bit down the road. We're, let, let's yeah, that's stick true. with the movies right now. Uh, so, Ghostbusters came and, and pretty much exploded. And it's like you said, it was, it was pretty much like a lightning strike. Because if you look at the premise, it sounds just dumb as hell. A comedy about four washed-up scientists hunting ghosts. Uh, so what do you think? What do you think it was that made this film such such a success? Well, I think a large part of it, a large large part of it, has to be the combination of Bill Murray's wit and Harold Ramis's R.I.P. Harold Ramis. Harold Ramis's writing, because he did, you know, write the script for the movie. I, well, I think it had a couple of writers, but he was one of them, and. Just the, the way... I, I can't even put it to words. It just works so well. It's, it's, it's difficult to describe why it works so well. Bill Murray's delivery of, of every line is basically perfect. And, you know, they actually had a lot of really, really good comedic actors just in this one movie. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, of course, Harold Ramis. Um, um, name st- slipping out of my head. Rick Moranis, Rick. thank you. I, his name just slipped right out of my brain. Rick Moranis, and even a few non-comedic actors like Sigourney Weaver. Um, and everyone is just really, really spot on. And the dialogue, this is one of the most quotable movies I have ever seen, which is borne out by the fact that literally everyone on the planet is constantly quoting it. <laughs> I can't I really can't describe it anything any better than that. It just it just works so well because of the power of the sheer talent in it. Uh, Brian, Cat, any you guys have anything to add to that? It just is. There is no explanation, and it, there is none needed. It just is. It's like it's like Dark Magic. Side. Go, Ghostbusters simply is. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 but yeah, it's, I think it's all everything. Sort of John sort of brought up. It all sort of. It, the writing, the dialogue, the acting, everything seemed to really work. Um, and also, even though it seems pseudo scientific, um, like anything that you know, what was it? Uh, that that um, Ray usually would st- say, and like his huge longs or Egon would say these huge long explanations of why ghosts are happening. You're sitting there going, "Oh yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense." So you're already like caught and brought into this world uh, at that moment. Even though, like, if you ask people, like, what does that mean? You're like, I don't know, but it sounded smart. <laughs> it's a big Twinkie. Uh, <laughs> Tell me about the Twinkie. What about the Twinkie? I'll say one more thing. I'll say one more thing that I kind of overlooked, and I feel bad for overlooking this. Um, I think another really strong point in its favor was simply the creativity of the ghost designs and the creature designs in the movie. Um... The special effects obviously look kind of dated by today's standards. You know, it's not it's not something that's going to be winning any Oscars these days. There's no CGI or any any of that fancy stuff like that. It's all done with good old fashioned practical effects and like superimposing things and all that other you know retro technology. But the designs of every ghost in the movie. The designs are really, really memorable and really, really creative. Uh, the two demon dogs, Zool and what was it, Vince Clortho. I always remember Zool. It's the other one whose name gives me trouble. I can never remember the second one. Yeah, Keymaster and Gatekeeper. Um, and, of course, Slimer. Everybody remembers Slimer. Um, before they even called him Slimer. I think I remember reading that his original name in the script was Onionhead. 
which was, yeah, was something really strange. <laughs> yes, it was really, really odd. But all of their designs are they they hit this particular aesthetic spot for me that I'm very, very fond of that you usually you don't see in a lot of movies. You mostly see it in like Halloween stores. It's kind of like it's what I call like creepy cartoonish. It's like it looks scary and it looks spooky, but it looks scary and spooky in a very unrealistic, exaggerated way. And it's an aesthetic I don't see very, I don't see nearly often enough in movies. Uh, you get a little bit of it in Fright Night, another great 80s movie that actually had special effects done by the same team, which is probably why they share an aesthetic. But I don't know, outside of the 80s, that kind of started to vanish, and I haven't really seen that in another movie that I can think of off the top of my head since then. Maybe a little bit for some of the creatures in Cabin in the Woods. But, yeah, I don't know. The, the ghosts, all of them, always stuck in my mind as being really memorably cool-looking. And I think that also contributed a lot to its success. And I rambled about that forever. <laughs> no, no, no. It was, it was an informed rambling, so that was good. Uh, now, the second Ghostbusters film, not as well received as the first, I recall. Not as good as the first. Not, yeah, but I wouldn't call it a bad film. Like it in terms of in terms of like movies, um, it's it's a better movie than most movies because it has the Ghostbusters in it. <laughs> Just by de facto. <laughs> I enjoy that reasoning, actually. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm I'm gonna own up to something right here, right now. You've that never is... seen the second Ghostbusters movie, the second Ghostbusters. Get out of my head. Is that head what you're about to say? <laughs> Jesus, you've never seen the second Ghostbusters. To make it worse. I am judging you as hard as I can. See, <laughs> I can do this worse. too. <laughs> to make it worse. I do have the DVD. <laughs> I just haven't watched it yet. Well, See, you can just go is, straight to the fucking pain glove there, <laughs> heathen. I am shaming I, you now. <laughs> I never leave the pain glove, cats. <laughs> you have all of the shame. See, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I loved the cartoon, saw a lot of it growing up as a kid. Really, really, really loved the first movie when I finally saw it. But I heard so many things about how the second one was disappointing compared to the first that I got to the point where I kind of didn't want to see it because I felt like it might, like, I don't know, tarnish the magic for me or something like that. I'm going to see it eventually. I just haven't done it yet. See, the, the first movie I ever saw, the first Ghostbusters movie I saw was actually the second one. Um, because uh, I, I'd watch the cartoons, um, you know, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, as I, on Saturday mornings. And then, um, you know, the, the second movie came on television. My dad called me in the living room to watch it. He thought it was the first one. Uh, and I, the, the, the image that stuck with me uh, for the most at like four years old watching this movie was a scene where uh, where, uh, De where uh, Sigourney Weaver's character is drawing a bath for her baby and the pink slime is coming out of the spigot and uh, I was scared to take a bath for uh, a good while after that. Yeah, I think I think kind of what happened is that because there was because it was like a five year break between the two films because I think even right now it's the 25th anniversary of the second film so it's almost like two different uh, anniversaries going on. And between that years, you had the real Ghostbusters. It became more of a family-friendly product over the time. So the second movie is a little bit watered down. It's more quote-unquote family-friendly. If you can call two ghosts uh, that were executed by the electric chair showing up in the courtroom family-friendly. <laughs> it was the 80s. Well, we put up know. with a lot more back then. <laughs> well, you know, in some states it's considered family-friendly. Yeah, So, but I think that's sort of that, that was like the big, <laughs> I guess... The big, con the big contention against the film, unfortunately. I have no real problems with the second film. Um, is it good at first? No, but it's, like I said, it's still a Ghostbusters film to me, so I was actually, I still yeah. enjoyed it. Although I, I, I to this day, go ahead, what Kat. Was the guy in the, the, the guy in the painting, like, why is that guy such a meme now? Vigo the Carpathian. <laughs> Yes, yes. Be Why are there so many memes about him? He's like really popular Cause, online. Because if you looked at his, because yeah, if you looked at his face, he disapproves of all of the things. <laughs> <laughs> 
He does. Like, he for was, a movie that, for he a was movie the that people cat generally... D- <laughs> <laughs> for a movie that people generally said, eh, to, like, he makes such good memes, and that kind of just is like, how did that come about? How do people still remember this guy enough to make him a meme? That's amazing. Congratulations, internet. <laughs> it is the internet. Anything can become a meme if you really try hard enough and you may not even realize it'll become a mean later down the line yes if you if you can answer that if you can answer that question satisfactorily then you will understand a great deal more of the universe than we knew before my local uh my local ghostbusters crew that's down here in uh san antone um they actually printed out um on uh like like a painting basically of vigo and they take it with them like the cons and stuff like that so you can get your picture taken with the painting (laughs) And like it's re- like they use like the best paper, so it looks like the painting from the film. So it's just like, you want your picture taken? Look, no, not really. <laughs> Why? Because it looks like he may come along. <laughs> All right, I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll tell you the sequence that I remember the most out of the the second film is uh, when they bring the Statue of Liberty to life and are steering around with an NES joystick. Oh, yeah! It was a different Because time. America. There's nothing more American than steering around the Statue of Liberty. It Because they had to uh, think positive and was the best, like, positive symbol in all of New York City, which is the place filled with, like, terrible people. Statue of Liberty. <laughs> uh, which we now know is a weeping angel. <laughs> <laughs> Take that into context. Okay. Wow. Um. All right. I, I don't think you're supposed to cross those particular streams. <laughs> but as, anyway, but as, as in, in between uh, the first and second film, uh, we got a uh, we got a cartoon series out of it, the real Ghostbusters. Uh, so named because there was actually another uh, Ghostbusters uh, television series out and about. So, uh, John well, Brian, actually, do you know a bit about that? Actually, I I can I can tell you a little bit about the history of that. Okay. Um, the filmation Ghostbusters cartoon. Wait, there was a cartoon was... as well. Oh, you didn't know about that? No, I only knew about the 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 live the the, the sitcom TV series. If you had read so the guy okay, in the gorilla okay. suit, read my notes that I threw in the air, you would have known it was also <laughs> cartoon. <laughs> <sighs> okay, okay. Here's here's how it worked. In the seventies, I believe. I think it was the seventies. There was a live action. I don't know if it was a series. I think it was actually a made-for-TV movie called uh simply called ghostbusters and it had i think larry storch um who probably not the only person in the who knows who he is he was a comedic actor in the before we were born times um <laughs> in the before time when dinosaurs walked the earth and guys in gorilla suits which used to be a much more common sight in weird tv shows and movies than it is these days um but Larry Storch and this guy in a gorilla suit and I think a couple other characters whose names escape me because I've never actually seen this thing. Uh, they, they were Ghostbusters. They went and they, they fought and caught ghosts. And funny enough, the, the, the word Ghostbusters, as far as I'm aware, goes at least back to like a Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis movie called um, Scared Stiff. Um, I remember them calling themselves Ghostbusters at one point. Maybe it has a longer history than that, I don't know. But the word at least goes back that far. But as the title of something, uh, the studio actually had to get permission. They had to work out a deal to uh, use the title for the movie Ghostbusters. Um, They worked out some sort of deal with uh, whoever it was that made that, uh, that old TV thing that nobody remembered. Uh, and when the movie became a huge hit, the copyright holders decided, hey, you know what? This is making money, and it has our property's name. We'll cash in on it by making an animated series of toys based off of that TV show that nobody remembers. But since it has the Ghostbusters name, people will buy it. So Filmation made an animated series based on it. And there were toys, and I did have some of them. Um... And it did indeed have the gorilla in it still. Um, It differed in a whole lot of ways from the Ghostbusters we're familiar with. They had the talking car, and um, instead of fighting just random ghosts of the week, they had like a set number of villains, uh, ghost villains, who were led by this this 
I, I kid you not, he was like a, a ro muscled up robotic skull faced guy in a red robe, and his name was Prime Evil. Um, wow, uh, that's the, actually kind of awesome. The, <laughs> the, he, he, the drug. You should look it up. The, the, oh, and there was also there was also a purple girl with pointed ears who was on their team who was either a time traveler or from another planet or both. I cannot recall which. So she was um, a Sumi Haruhi character. Basically, yeah. And basically, they called the cartoon the real Ghostbusters because they wanted to differentiate it from that one and also to be like a take that at them because they were like, yeah, well, we're the real Ghostbusters, okay? So it was it basically it was kind of a losing contest. But I bought the toys from both of them. I so just want to know why the gorilla was not the one named Kong. That... You know... I, just, uh, I think it was like Tracy the Daisy Christmas. or something weird like that, because I guess that's how Tracy. comedy works. Kong is too, it's too easy, too easy. You gotta name it Daisy. That's funny. Comedy. Eh. Yeah. So anyway, but, <laughs> anyway... Real Ghostbusters comes out and storms Saturday morning uh, Saturday morning cartoon blocks, and it's it's remarkable to go back and look at. It. It's actually one of the more faithful uh, film to cartoon adaptations uh, that's ever existed. Because you see, you know, you didn't you don't really look at the Ghostbusters and think, oh, this lends itself well to a cartoon series. But you know, Real Ghostbusters came and made it work. So, what do you think the secret to the success of Real Ghostbusters was? Hmm. I would actually disagree. I think it's a franchise that lends itself incredibly well to a cartoon. Because, um, think about all the crazier ghosts that you can put in there and how much easier that's going to be when you don't have to worry about spending lots of money on practical effects and you can just animate it and you don't have to worry about the limitations of real life. Um, Pretty much. So I, I think it, it, it works really well as a cartoon. It's not something that I would expect uh, to end up as a cartoon, just because it's not really a kid movie. Um, I, I don't even, I don't even in my mind consider Ghostbusters a family movie because there's like way too many kind of like mature themes going on. Um, so I'm kind of surprised that it ended up that way. Uh, but on the other hand, toys, 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 toys. All of the toys. See, the thing is, the thing is, um, Ghostbusters came out uh, just seven years after uh, after the original Star Wars. And same year, I think, nope, a year after Return of the Jedi, that's right. And Star Wars is the property that really blew the lid off of merchandising, uh, merchandising and licensing movie products. Uh, it, it happened before Star Wars, but it was not as big of a deal before Star Wars. Star Wars is kind of what made it uh, ubiquitous. And I love that movie so much. But, um... Clearly, you've used it about six times this episode. Yeah, my use of that word is becoming ubiquitous. <laughs> but, um, I will slap you. I swear to God I will. <laughs> I'm just, like, really pushing my luck this episode. <laughs> but the thing about merchandising movies is... Hollywood didn't think it was a big idea before Star Wars, which is one of the reasons why George Lucas retained all of the merchandising rights when he made the original Star Wars, because basically nobody expected that to be worth anything. Um, and that's one of the reasons George Lucas wound up becoming a billionaire. Um, but after Star Wars... They kind of they kind of started scrambling to start merchandising and licensing and tying in things, but they didn't really have a an exceedingly strong handle on what was and wasn't appropriate yet. Like these days, they would be way more cautious about what they would uh, what they would do. But back then, they they kind of were willing to try just about anything. So whoever it was that suggested, hey, we should make a cartoon out of this and sell action figures, basically, probably the paperwork was being drawn up before he'd, he'd finished speaking. Um, because everybody wanted a chance to make Star Wars money, essentially. Um, you know, I mean, it worked out. There were, there were other, like, really weirdly 
inappropriate properties that got made in cartoons, like, you know, Beetlejuice is something, I'm not really sure. <laughs> That's, like, the number one thing. It's like, <laughs> please, please tell me your kids didn't watch this, because I watched it and I had fucking nightmares, because it was so fucking weird. I mean, yeah. But yet, I... a popular cartoon. What? But, we, it's seriously, we yeah. digress. So, um, so, alright, so, go, get, getting the train back on the tracks uh, with Ghostbusters... Um, what do you think? What do you think was the, the? Do you think it was it was just the marketability that made this show such a success, or was there something some some internal merit of its own that it had? Because I remember the I remember the cartoon being extraordinarily funny as a child, but then again, as a child, I don't know my my tastes were kind of, you know, erratic. There, there are episodes of the cartoon which do still hold up really really well even today. There are also episodes of the cartoon which are really, really terrible. Um, I, a friend of mine actually made me watch like the two worst episodes of the real Ghostbusters ever made recently, and someday his body will be found. But <laughs> the, the, when they were on, they were really, really on. The other thing is that, especially from a kid's perspective, the show could sometimes be like really weirdly creepy um and you know some of these things are more nightmarish when you're a kid there's one episode in particular again that my friend it stuck out in his mind that, that freaked him out as a kid there was an episode about um the sandman um deciding that he wanted to bring peace to the world by just putting everyone to sleep for like a century or something like that and their dreams started manifesting when they were when they were asleep into reality. And that wasn't the creepy thing. The creepy thing was the Sandman's voice. He was like this weird white-faced blobbish thing with like I think he had blank red or yellow eyes or something like that. And his voice was like this. Everything he said. Sleep. <laughs> That's how John is going to yeah, sound when he talks to his grandkids. <laughs> when I was your age. <laughs> See, the, the two episodes that stand out the most in my mind are uh, the ones with uh, Murray the Mantis, the giant praying mantis uh, attacking New York, and the other one which was basically a spoof on Citizen Kane. Uh, the, the Ghostbusters get hired by this magazine called Spooks Illustrated, to catch the ghost of Charles Foster Hearst. And uh, he spends they spend the whole episode chasing after this ghost who's who keeps chanting Rosebud. And it turns out, just like in the movie, Rosebud was his sled. And uh, the the joke that I that that I remember most clearly to this day from that episode uh, was actually when they're talking about that, wow, we got hired by Spooks Illustrated. And Venkman and Egon are talking, and Venkman's like, I used to love Spooks Illustrated, especially the swimsuit issue. And Egon was like, I always dreamed of being on the cover. And Venkman's like, of the swimsuit issue? <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you, the writing, it's sharp. I'll always w remember one episode where they got lured out to, I think it was Transylvania, or at least some place that was Transylvania-ish by an aristocratic vampire, that they, though they didn't know he was a vampire at the time. And he wanted their help, I don't remember all the details, he wanted their help dealing with like this this conflict that was going on between, the vamp between vampires and werewolves. And the only thing I really remember is at the end of the episode, like the vampires and the werewolves got into this big fight with each other and they were rolling around and like, one of the Ghostbusters was like, hey, what do you suppose happens when a vampire bites a werewolf, or a werewolf bites a vampire? And they look at them, and they start, like, mutating into these part vampire, part werewolf monstrosities, like werewolves with bat wings and this other stuff, and they were just like, well, okay, time to go, and they just flat out left. <laughs> <laughs> they just got in the car, said, nope, and they drove off, and that was how it ended. <laughs> There's a limit. Even the Fuck. Ghostbusters have their limit of them. They're just crazy. <laughs> They're just like, Fuck this shit, we're out. I also What's great about that is that that could be either really lazy writing or really <laughs> clever writing. Take your pick. I also remember there was one episode, 
may be the nerdiest one they ever did because they kind of jumped on board this nerd bandwagon before uh, before it started getting really, really popular. Uh, Hipsters. They, yeah, I know, right? They did an episode about Cthulhu. <gasps> Straight up Cthulhu. It was called, it was actually called The Collect Call of Cthulhu. And they knee deep, knee deep in the nerdery references. There was a cult trying to revive him. The, there was the whole the stars are right. They specifically mentioned weird tales and Lovecraft and the Necronomicon. They encountered Star Spawn of Cthulhu in the sewers under New York. And uh, t- to compound the nerdery, they even made a callback to the movie when they were trying to measure Cthulhu's P- power on the PKE meter. And they said that he was like topping out at like hundreds or thousands of times stronger than Gozer. Like, they specifically did that, and I'm like, this is the nerdiest episode wow. this show ever done, ever did, and it is awesome. <laughs> ever done did. Ever done did. What about you, Brian? It's Are there a any beautiful ep- thing. Were there any episodes that stood out, to, stand out in your memory? Uh, there's the Grundle. Um, the reason that sort of stands out, because that Grundle shows back up in Extreme Ghostbusters, but the Grundle, the go- this ghost... What it did was that it would find bad children and then just sort of influence them to be constantly bad. And after they, the child's under the power of the, I think it's the Grendel or the Grundle. Um, after they're under the power of this ghost, that child will slowly turn into uh, another Grundle. And then once it's fully transformed, he goes and finds another child and does the same thing over and over again. I was like, this is just creepy. Like. <laughs> This isn't. This isn't even like like just scary or anything like that. This is just creepy because he's just. This is just the ghost that goes to the windows going, "Hey kid, come out and play, child. That, that, come out and yeah, play." That was the line, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. This is like, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not coming out and play. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> that's this kind of thing. That's kind. That's kind of line where you look at it and go, "Define play, please." <laughs> <laughs> By what definition of the word are you operating? I know for a fact we are breaking several laws. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> but what I think, but, uh, what think we're sort of ignoring, though, is that, um, um, yeah, the writing was pretty good. Uh, the animation for a while actually was really stellar. Um, I think until they had this sort of, they sort of changed around some of the character designs around Ghostbusters 2. Uh, but it was also the voice cast was really strong in this. Um, you had veterans uh, like uh, Maurice LaMarche as as Egon and Frank Walken as Ray. And Arsenio Hall. Do you guys know this? Arsenio Hall was Winston. For like... I actually really? did not like know Like for the that. first couple See, of seasons, that, it, was, uh, it was Arsenio. I knew that uh, Lorenzo Music, uh, better known as the voice of Garfield, was the voice of um, Venkman. Yeah, but now, he See, unfortunately this, this couldn't... Because he couldn't continue the whole series. Do you know who they got after him? You'll love this. Who? who Dave Coulier from Full House. That's right. They did. Do you know why they replaced him, actually? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I, I, heard, I heard that the reason why they replaced him was because Bill Murray got pissed off that music didn't sound enough like him in the cartoon, which becomes hysterical when you go and you watch the Gar- the Bill Murray Garfield movie, and you uh-huh. start to think, this guy must have had a personal vendetta against music, that he just shits over everything he did. Pretty much, it's just, it's, it really was, they, they replaced him because Bill Murray didn't like his voice. Um, that's the long and the short of it, that is the whole story right there. Which sucks, because I think Lorenzo Music's uh, take on Vangman was so much better than the guy that they replaced him with. Yeah, Dave, yeah, Dave, Dave Coulier. Coulier did more of a, here's my sort of impression of Bill Murray, where Lorenzo Music was like, this is Vankman. this is the character Vankman. Like, I watched the film, yeah. this is how he sort of acts. This is how I see him as this character. And Dave, and I'm not going to give anything away from Dave Coulier because he's actually not that bad of a voice actor. But it was obviously when they brought him in, they said, just try to be as Bill Murray as you can. And so it's like... And here, here's, th- this actually brings up something that's actually kind of funny about the TV show. Uh, and, and it also ties in with the title, The Real Ghostbusters. One of the running jokes throughout the series is that the Ghostbusters movies exist in the cartoon universe. And... The, the the reason why those movies got made is because the Ghostbusters signed away the rights to have those movies made. So the Ghostbusters in the cartoon are the actual historical Ghostbusters. The movie are is is a fiction within their own universe. That would and, also explain why they don't look anything like Bill Murray, Harold Ramis, Dan Aykroyd, any of them. 
And that joke actually got a callback in the last epi- in the second to last episode of Extreme Ghostbusters when the original Ghostbusters come back to visit Egon, and Egon goes, "So Venkman, how are things in Hollywood? Any chance of another movie being made about us?" <laughs> it, it's really strange when when shows are self aware like that. <laughs> Strange, and they even but entertaining. and they even hung a lampshade on the change of the character designs. They devoted a whole episode to the fact that Janine had had changed her appearance. Yeah, then they just I thought just they looked at her or something like I think you've changed Janine. Like that's not the only. <laughs> no, there's a whole there's a whole episode like a, a whole episode plot centered around this, and it turned out that like the Janine of Ghostbusters two was an imposter, like a spirit that had kidnapped Janine and 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 replaced her. And the whole episode was they had to go back and rescue original Janine. That's that's just <laughs> weird. <laughs> that's that's a that's it's a writing room though. three o'clock in the morning going. Well, God, just make a friggin' episode. What do you guys have? <laughs> I've heard of Stranger Things. <laughs> Don't get me started on some of the things the Sonic the Hedgehog comic has done. So, but no, it's just like I don't. Know, it, it was it was a show that wasn't afraid to take to to take risks with its writing. And uh, and still have fun with it, and then after that, the the, the Ghostbusters franchise kind of died down for a bit for a few years until we got Extreme Ghostbusters in uh, the late '90s. Now, did, I I remember watching that religiously. Did you guys see it at all? I I did watch it. No, I, I know I didn't. I did. I I watched. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I'm just like I remember because Extreme Ghostbusters sort of came out that same time. I want to say like Batman Beyond came out. Um, and mm-hmm. it was the weird, like the moment where studios were trying to sort of build legacy shows, because Batman Beyond's connected to Batman the Animated Series, and Extreme Ghostbusters was not sort of a reboot, but it was a legacy show. It was like, all right, real Ghostbusters happened. Now this is the story after that, and so you still this had is Ghostbusters, the next generation. Yeah, so you had you still had Egon there, uh, still voiced by uh, Maurice Lamarche. So you had that sort of connection to it, and they would call back to the old show, but you had a new cast you were following around. And it honestly, it was a risk. I don't think it paid off the way they wanted it to, but that show gets so I, that show gets such amount of un, uh, un like I think un word I can't think of. It gets so much undeserved, undeserved yeah, undeserved shit from a lot of people, and I feel sorry because it wasn't a bad show necessarily but I can see why people were upset of the sort of change in cast members and how they sort of went about and doing it and how it a lot of people called PC police on them because it was uh, a guy in a wheelchair um, another black guy a girl and then a Latino guy but that doesn't matter because they were good characters nonetheless oh yeah I think, uh, to me, the, the, I go back and, and I hear a lot of people were really jarred by the tone of the show. Because it wasn't as heavy on the comedy as the real Ghostbusters was. Because uh, Extreme Ghostbusters came out in this weird period during the mid-90s of, like, gargoyles and extreme dinosaurs and street sharks. Where everything had to be, like, extreme and dark and gritty. If you don't know what that is, John, I'm not going to explain it to you. 90s. It's Jawsome. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Apparently the street sharks are jawsome. <laughs> they awesome. they were in fact. Yeah. I am very familiar. I I am familiar with uh, with pretty much all of those Ninja Turtle knockoff uh, knockoff franchises. I did not watch many of them, but I knew they existed. Yeah, and- including but not limited to Cowboys of Moo Mesa and Biker Mice from Mars. There's the, you know, the Biker Mice, but this, the Extreme Ghostbusters also existed where. Comedy was because it was the '90s, so everyone was super sarcastic, um, except for like the one guy, because one guy always has to be the straight guy. That's how it sort of works. But everybody had, and basically, the show was character portrayals, and everyone really wanted to be Vankman, but turned up a little bit to New York obnoxiousness, um, except for I forget Carlton. The, uh, 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 Carlton Roland. Thank you, Roland, who was played by Carlton from Fresh Prince of Bel Air, um, and he was the straight guy. So like everyone was super sarcastic except for him because he was the square. He play- actually when I think about it, Roland and Carlton is the same character. Holy shit! And now Brian. But did he no. dance? But did no, he? No, because they never had a season two. And now, and now Brian is off to write Fresh Prince Extreme Ghostbusters fan fiction. No, 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 no. It's not fan fiction, but. The- it's a parallel universe. Somehow, in this parallel universe, Carlton never moved to the 
to to Bel Air and he became a Ghostbuster. Carlton was born in Bel Air. Well, maybe his okay. It was Will his Smith parents never moved. went to Bel. Uh, don't worry, listen. This is why it's okay. I'll figure this all out in editing. <laughs> You're not the editor. He's sitting down and he's got charts just drawn out and he's like, okay, in this alternate universe, this never happened. This never happened. And 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 Will never did try to play that game of B ball. <laughs> oh, no, he tried to play the game well, of B ball, but like it didn't work out and maybe he he got killed. So he becomes a ghost and becomes a guest star. <laughs> and it all and it all t- ties back to, to because Hitler had salami instead of bacon. It's a butterfly effect, man. You never know what your choices can do. You don't know. Yeah, anyway, but, um, anyway. Anyway. <laughs> putting a train back we were on talking the tracks. about We were talking about the darker tone of extreme yeah. Ghostbusters. And that is something that stood out to me when I watched it. I didn't watch it as religiously as Gonzo, but I did see several episodes. And I was struck by how willing it was to be uh, really, really creepy. I remember in particular an episode about um, a sphinx that was going around and asking people riddles. Um, oh, well, yeah. specifically one riddle. It was asking that. No, no, that it was asking riddle. the riddle. Yeah, it was asking the riddle from from Oedipus Rex. You know, walk on two legs, uh, walk on four legs in the morning, walk on two legs in the day, walk on three legs in the evening. Uh, and it had the most also, sultry I voice realized... I could ima- I could imagine. I swear to God, you find cl- <laughs> if you find clips of this Sphinx on YouTube, I swear to God, audible chocolate. And then Gonzo spent the rest of the episode searching for Rule Thirty Four. Uh, no, I have standards. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it was of the, sp- of the Sphinx uh, specifically. I mean, you know, do you have a guilty conscience? I'm, I'm, anyway, I'm fired now. Um, you know, just just once, just once, Sphinx. I'd like to have a show just not go off the rails. <laughs> we were talking about Ghostbusters suddenly goes in, in, into accusations about my porn surfing habits. <laughs> what I look, what I look at when I slap my monkey is none of your business, and neither is my porn collection. So, John, about the Moving extreme on. Ghostbusters. When, <laughs> <laughs> if you answered the ri- answered. If you answered the riddle incorrectly, the Sphinx took your eyes. Um, it wasn't like in a graphic or gory way. Your eyes just kind of like magically floated out of your head. Well, no, that, no, uh, that was that was a different episode. That was a different episode. Oh, was the, it? The, the, yeah, that was uh, Khalil that did that. The Sphinx just made you an idiot. And oh, then, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm conflating episodes, man. Yeah. No, the Sphinx well, just made I you an idiot. I do remember... Okay. I did remember someone who stole eyes. Yeah, that was and that I was. I remember that was Khalil. That incredibly creepy. Um, granted, when they defeated the ghost, everybody magically got their eyes back. But even notwithstanding that, people with like empty sockets is is pretty is pretty freaky for for a show that you know kids are watching after school. And I never saw this episode, but apparently there was also a ghost that stole people's bones. <laughs> No, you want to you want to talk about creepy? Let's talk about the 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 giant bug man that uh, tried to make Janine its qu- its queen, and uh, the the pseudo rapey undertones of that story. Although that also gave that also gave uh, what I think the funniest moment in that uh, in that whole series, where the they, just, they figure out that the way to break uh, Janine out from the spell is for Egon to flirt with her, and he does it the most yeah. hand fisted. <laughs> awkward way possible he's, first off he starts he's trying to pay her confidence like you know we need you to come back Gene we'll never find another uh, we won't find another temp like you with your organizational <laughs> skills he's like no 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 tell her you love her uh uh give me a kiss Janine give me some <laughs> sugar baby <laughs> <laughs> I vaguely remember that <laughs> Another thing I remember is like every, in Extreme Ghostbusters was every character got at least one spotlight episode. Even even Janine got one where she put on the proton pack and kicked some ass. Well, that's 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 uh, not that, a rare thing. That happened thing. in the original show yeah. too. Yeah. So that's not really a rare thing. She does that. Like, um, if we ever uh, if, I, if you ever read the IDW comics, like there's a whole there's a whole story arc of her taking over the Ghostbusters franchise because the. The four, the original four, go missing. 
I'm gonna have to go where, back and. Uh, where did they go? They went to a, some weird. Did they go to Waffle House? No, they got kidnapped by a ghost. Uh, they were sent off into this sort of side dimension. Um, they had to sort of uh, escape it. The reason they were sent over there is the the ghosts were smart enough to go. You know, if we just get rid of them, they won't be here. Oh, that okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, now they're, they're over there. All right, sweet. They just didn't realize Janine was gonna be like, God damn it, and then hire a bunch of new Ghostbusters. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let's let's talk a bit about the comics. The 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 IDW Ghostbusters comics were kind of a surprise addition to the roster, weren't they, Brian? They were. What happened was is that um, in 2008, IDW got the license to the Ghostbusters comics. Um, they also, I mean, they they also, I think, also got eventually got the real Ghostbusters, which came out around the time the original show came out. But it came out through Now Comics, which no longer exists, and Marvel. You wait, hang on. I'm 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 confused now. They got. The, so they're, they're doing a series based on Ghostbusters and the real Ghostbusters? Well, no, they collected the original real Ghostbusters into an omnibus. You didn't let me finish. You need, you oh. need to let me finish. <laughs> and suddenly you're, you're, you've turned Irish. A little bit. Anyway, but what, they ha- what has happened is they got the uh, license in 2008, but they didn't do a series straight off the bat. They did several miniseries which, and a couple of one-shots. Which ranged from, that's all right, to, well, this isn't very good. So, they it wasn't really Ghostbuster-esque quite yet. Until 2011, where they officially just said, all right, we're going to start an ongoing. Um, and the writers for it, I believe, were uh, Eric, Eric Bunham and Tristan Jones. And they kicked it out of the park. Like, just knocked it, not home run after home run. Because it started to feel like Ghostbusters, uh again and it's connected straight to the movies so everything that happened in the first two movies is canon to them so they sort of followed from that and eventually they started adding characters from extreme ghostbusters kylie was the first who uh was working in Rand's uh, uh bookshop she she was first just a cameo they're like hey we remember this show yay and then they're like skirt add her to the team so she got added to the team and i believe um what's his name Eduardo. Eduardo actually was getting added to the team as well. Unfortunately, if you remember my headlines from last week, something has happened in September. IDW is ending the, sh- the comic. Um, it's not canceled by sales like usually. It's just sort of ending. And no one's really sure, except for people inside IDW, know why. Uh, which is sad because the 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 issues that they the issues that have are some of the best Ghostbusters. Like I've read in a long period of time, and they really, they got, like the writers and the creators are really proud of these stories. Um, they really help expand out the universe uh, even more. And it just, it feels like when you're reading it, and especially when you're reading licensed things, if you can read it and you can hear the voices of the characters in your head, you know you have a good story. Like you know it's something's clicking correctly. All right, so uh, what, were, what were some standout moments from uh, the comic that you've seen so far? The absolute best standout moment is what I was talking about earlier, is that uh, it was called the new Ghostbusters arc. I wish it lasted a little bit longer, but after you know some, some good uh, in the first sort of series of Ghostbusters, they did the fighting ghosts, they had some uh, issues with a fellow Ghostbuster team, I, I think called something else, uh, who was trying to build their own, who built their own proton packs. Um, and almost destroyed the world because that's usually what happens. Uh, but the new Ghostbusters was where things really got uh, into the next level because what I ha- explains that uh, Ray, uh, Egon, Peter, and Winston they all get transported to this ultimate dim- alternate dimension and is stuck there. They can't escape. And so Janine gets Kylie, um, a FBI agent. Well, I can't remember her name, and one of the other Ghostbusters they had fought against earlier to sort of pick up the slack because as they're gone ghosts are running rampant across the city so it's sort of this race to figure out where did the ghostbusters go and we need to make sure the city doesn't go completely you know nuts over uh over these all these new ghosts where we're also dealing with our old friend peck who is sort of the liaison between the ghostbuster and the city now because they there's a deal in place that like all right we'll let you operate under supervision and peck is still peck he's still an asshole like they try, he tried to change their costumes, and uh, Janine like just lets him have it. Going, we have to run, like through Central Park and other parts of the city. I'm not wearing fucking shorts. 
So it was like, yeah, that arc is basically just Janine kicking ass. Okay. All right. And uh, all right. So we're, we're worth checking out these comics then? Absolutely. Um, IDW has, what's well, really cool is IDW has uh, the first collection set. They had one book for it called Full Containment, where it's the, the, the complete first series. Um, I'm hoping they do that for the second half of it. So there's two big collections. But right now they're available uh, in trade paperback form. Uh, the series is ending, like I said, in September. So uh, the last trade will probably be out by October. October or November. And then uh, another piece of media that the, the Ghostbusters have uh, invaded is uh, the realm of video games. Uh, there have been, I think, a couple of uh, Ghostbusters games. Uh, the first was the first one that I can recall is one for the NES, which was awful. Um, and we will speak no more. Well, here, I'm going to tell you this right now. To my knowledge, there are two good Ghostbuster games. There is the one that came out uh, recently for like the 360 and PS3, and then there's the arcade. To my knowledge, those are the only two good Ghostbuster video games. Now, I didn't know there was an arcade game. Oh, you didn't? Oh. No, I did this not. This is so weird to have in video game information that you don't know. Is this what you feel like all the time? What? <laughs> This is how I feel when I when I get to put one over on you about comic book trivia. Which is actually not that hard, because like I said, my memory's terrible. But, <laughs> um, the, yeah, there was an arcade version where it was sort of like half... It wasn't full top-down, it was like tilted down. And you were just basically going through levels, zapping ghosts and catching ghosts. It was one of the four players. Um, luckily, it wasn't Battletoad, so you didn't accidentally kill anyone. Um, and I think you didn't have to worry about crossing the streams either because that would suck so bad in that game like all right i'm gonna get this guy no i'm gonna get this guy Boop, game over thanks <laughs> asshole <laughs> <laughs> well the, the the xbox 360 and uh and ps3 game which is also on a uh, pc as i discovered looking through steam um what made that game so awesome in my eyes is the fact that they actually brought back not only the original cast but uh, dan Aykroyd and harold ramus actually wrote the script uh, for the game. So it really did feel like an actual Ghostbusters 3, although it, it did kind of stretch credibility. Like, okay, we're going back to that hotel again? Why does shit keep going down there? Because that's where Slimer likes to hang out. Yeah. But uh, it was... it was Gameplay-wise, it played pretty much like Gears of War, except, you know, with ghost traps. Uh, but the dialogue uh, to that game was so hysterical, and it was really, it really, it kind of made me, brought a nostalgic tear to my eyes as I was playing it, to have the the old gang back together for one last run. And uh, it was just, it was such a, an, an, an incredibly nostalgic experience. If you haven't had a chance to play it and you're a Ghostbusters fan, definitely check it out. Um, but I guess that sort of brings us to uh, a, a, sort of a sad bit of a discussion here in that uh, I don't think we'll ever see uh, the old ga the, the old gang back together again ever again, especially now that uh, Harold Ramis has passed away. Yeah, that's 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 really sad. And we're, we're never going to get... I, I know we made the joke, but yeah. Basically, Ghostbusters the video game is Ghostbusters 3. We should just all accept that and move on. And so. by all, we particularly mean Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> Mostly Dan Aykroyd. Because he, he's pretty much the only person who actually wants Ghostbusters 3 at this point. Um, Harold Ramis is gone. Bill Murray wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole, no matter how much you paid him. Besides Studio, the fact that he's, he's old as fuck now. I will, no, I'll tell you, yeah, I will well, tell you one way. I'll tell you one way. Uh, Bill Murray will do Ghostbusters 3. And that's if Wes Anderson directs it. I was going to suggest Dark Sorcery, but that works too. <laughs> okay. I, such a strange, strange thought, Wes Anderson's Ghostbusters 3. Oh man, I gave now, him an okay, idea. Okay, who's, who's Wes Anderson? Wes Anderson, the guy who makes all those real like artsy films, like the Grand Budapest Hotel... Uh, the Royal Tenenbaums, Life Aquatic, the fantastic, the fantastic Mr. Fantastic Fox. Fox. So he, really fucking weird. So he wants to, so he wants to turn it into an art house film. I don't see how that would work. Yeah, it's well, Bill Murray really likes working. Yeah, that, 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 the, the, the joke say. was every Wes Anderson film has Bill Murray, so that would be the only way Bill Murray would be in a new Ghostbusters. 
I'm gonna have to explain a joke w like this. Wes it's Anderson. not that funny anymore. You asshole. Wes. <laughs> Wes Anderson is just like really, really big on like that quirky art house vibe where it's like you know, it's it's it's. He just has his own style, and trying to imagine that meshing with Ghostbusters is the weirdest thing I've ever thought of. Okay. All right. <laughs> I will say this. I'm honestly shocked no one's thought to do another animated series. Like, why Why let, why let? sit, like, why let this really cool concept just cool on the on the uh, bench, you know? And, and, you know, I think I think an animated series would be pretty much the only way that they could do it. Because if, if you think about today's film climate, I don't think a Ghostbusters 3 film would do well in today's, in today's climate. And I neither really does Hollywood. That's, that's another reason why it hasn't been coming along. Apparently, Dan Aykroyd Although, kudos, has been... Although, kudos to Hollywood for deciding not to make a sequel for once. Well, it's it's literally it's literally only it's there's no moral or artistic component to this. It is literally only because Hollywood is unconvinced it would make them enough money to justify it. Um, because that that's the basis of every decision in Hollywood. Will this make us obscene amounts of cash? Yes. Okay, do it. Won't it? Okay, pass it. So, um, well, we're let we're, it's, it's sort two. of it's 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 a devil's sort of thing. Like their yeah. greed is keeping us from having a mediocre product. So that's it's it's a draw. It's a draw. That's what this is. It's a draw. Ghost Ghostbusters one was like was number one for five straight weeks. It was a huge unexpected breakout success that they didn't they didn't meddle too much in because they didn't have high expectations for it. They had really, really high expectations for Ghostbusters 2, so they meddled in it constantly at every phase of its production, and that's one of the reasons why it didn't turn out as well as Ghostbusters 1, and a huge part of the reason why Bill Murray wants nothing to do with the franchise anymore. He had such a bad experience with all the executive meddling on Ghostbusters 2, and because, in the large part of their meddling, the second one uh, actually really underperformed uh, compared to the first one, uh, it did not meet their expectations for it. And ever since then, they've been wary of even touching it. So, yeah. We have seen the last new Ghostbusters movie on the big screen, unless someone comes along and decides to completely reboot it and don't rule that out as a possibility. I would think that if you're if you're going to to go ahead, this is sort of a, 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 a pet a pipe a pet pipe dream of mine. But I would think that if you're going to do another Ghostbusters movie, you need to do what you did with Extreme Ghostbusters with the video game, and that's sort of have sort of a passing of the torch. That's uh, kind of what Dan Aykroyd wants to do with Ghostbusters three, if it ever happens, which. It's kind of sort of what he wants to do, especially since, you know, only 50% of the uh, of the team, the original team, is even willing and able to return. <laughs> yeah, Ernie Hudson's just sitting Good. around going, come on, guys. Come on. Anytime. <laughs> yeah, his, his, basic, his basic philosophy about the entire thing has just been, eh, I'll do it if they ever get around to it. Okay. Um, well, I think that about, uh, we've about run the whole gamut of, uh, Ghostbusters there, media here. There is Rick? actually one more thing I wanted to mention before What's we that? close out this episode. If you guys have not ever had the chance to see the original Ghostbusters in an actual theater full of nerds, next month, August, uh, I believe 29th, let me double check that, it might be the 30th, uh... 29th, I was correct. On the 29th, there are going to be about 700-odd theaters nationwide. Of course, this is only in the U.S., so sorry to our international listeners. We do love you. We just can't control Hollywood um, yet. But <laughs> about 700 theaters uh, around, this, around the U.S. are going to be showing it. Um, so check and see if it's playing somewhere near you. Put on your geeky costume, bring some marshmallows like they did at Brian's Theater, and go check it out if you have the chance, because it is so worth it. It is so worth it. Okay, right. now I'm done. Well, uh, <laughs> that seems to about cover it. 
So, uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that pretty much, we pretty much run the gamut on Ghostbusters related media, and that about wraps up, uh, our show for this week. Uh, thank you as always for tuning in, and as I'm looking at our schedule here, let me find the schedule here and make sure I'm not about to announce something that we're not doing next week. Where is it? Brendan emailed me the schedule. Here it is. Okay. All right. Okay. And uh, that about so that about wraps everything up for this week. And as I look at my schedule here, uh, I see uh, next week we're going to be doing Sailor Moon Crystal, which <coughs> I, I can't hear I now. Didn't need, I didn't need those eardrums. What? I'm so excited. What? I'm, Yay! And I'm pretty <coughs> sure Cat just had an orgasm right here in the studio. What? So, yes, next week we'll be doing a Sailor Moon uh, retrospective and looking at the uh, premiere of Sailor Moon Crystal, which premieres uh, this Saturday, Kat? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to put all of the information about Sailor Moon's release into my headlines. So, uh, yeah. Okay, all right. So, uh, we will see you next week for what is, uh, we'll see you next week for what's uh, sure to be an awesome show. Uh, so, as always, thank you for tuning in. As always, I'm Dr. Gonzo. I'm the cat. I'm Dr. Peter Vankman. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Eh? Tough job. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next week. Taka, play us out.